I got some, some good news and bad news. The bad news is we only got one presentation left. The good news is, is we still got a presentation left. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin Aylshire is wrapping up our evening with his presentation, Poet for Hire. Imagine you're sitting by the fountain in Washington Square Park. From the multitude, a beautiful woman approaches and asks you to write her a poem about how the only reason she hasn't killed herself is because her grandmother is so kind she couldn't bear to make her unhappy. She wanders back into the crowd, and now you have 10 minutes to write her this. Why I didn't do it. What if it were possible to be so selfless that every day your body shrank in its thin gown until you disappeared? And what if I told you that your slow vanishing act was the only thing keeping me from evaporating all at once, in a flash, drops of water dancing on a hot stove? What she hasn't told you is that she's been planning to kill herself that very night. The poem is just a part of how she's bidding farewell to this world. She reads it, bursts into tears, you kiss her wet face and say her life is just beginning, and then you ask to, her to marry you, and she says yes, but you live in the back of a vintage warehouse in Bushwick, and she lives in Japan. Technically, we're still engaged. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Benjamin Aylshire, and for most of the previous decade, I made my living this way. Usually, I say that I've written somewhere around 10,000 poems for strangers, everywhere from Burlington to Havana, San Francisco to Paris, Berlin to Brattleboro. I also do other stuff, which I think informs who I am as a poet. Instead of going to college, I started touring as a trumpet player with a band called the Vermont Joy Parade in a school bus running off fry grease that was either gifted to us by restaurants or pumped out of their dumpsters in the middle of the night. <laughs> when I was 18, I worked 60-hour weeks at three restaurants simultaneously and then hitchhiked through Latin America for six months with a 35-millimeter camera which happens to be when I started writing my first readable poems. This portrait was taken in the foothills of a volcano in Guatemala. I suspect I was always destined to become a poet. Since childhood, I've been sallow-eyed and discontented, obsessed with images and words, and had an appetite for experience that uh, borders on reckless. This is me in Cuttingsville the unincorporated hamlet in southern Vermont where I grew up. My father was something of a hoarder. When I gravitated to Burlington, he sent his old royal portable with me, which I used to pound out poems in the apartment above Radio Beam, which is where I met a dashing young poet named Robert McKay, who used to type spontaneously for people at parties as a sort of Dadaist parlor game. <laughs> Back then, the rent in Burlington wasn't suicidally high. The art scene in Burlington was a wild soup of creativity. I started a letterpress publishing cooperative to publish Robert's book, Cities of Rain, and applied for a table in the farmer's market, where we wrote poems for passersby as they shopped for vegetables and cheese. From there, I started touring to all the cities where my band had played and busking in the same spots. This is Royal Street in New Orleans. Soon, I was getting weird offers to appear at festivals, lucrative yet evil corporate gigs, and once a billionaire's wedding at a private island in the Adriatic, which I fumbled by asking for too much money. <laughs> Sometimes people don't really believe that I could make a living doing this, and I think that's because so much deprivation and labor goes unseen. I sold over $10,000 worth of this chapbook I hand sewed, for example. Even when my bank account was below zero, I was still only three book sales away from whining and dining myself. Niemand kann alles richtig machen, aber jeder etwas anderem. Diese Menschen haben schon mal angefangen. I have no idea what that means, only that a, a German newspaper called me a Weltverbesserer, or world betterer, which did wonders for my ego until I realized it has connotations of naive uh, idealism, too. Uh, I think I'm going to run out of time with this slide, but I'll, this is Tom Stoppard who asked me for a poem uh, in New Orleans. One time, and I did not recognize him or realize that he was still alive. Um, <laughs> I love sticking weird things in typewriters. This was for the former poet laureate Tracy K. Smith, 
who had just flown in for the Burlington Book Festival, and she could only pay in Korean won, which I rolled into nice. my Olivetti and handed back to her, which is the moment I first fully realized poetry was a way I could move through the world. Sometimes poets just have to show their whole ass. This is a flyer I made for an erotic party in Brooklyn that hired me, which was pretty vanilla compared to the actual orgy in San Francisco, inside a, a former clock tower where I wrote poems for guests as they copulated freely all around me. No photos of that. Um, working in Europe. Working in Europe can be difficult. I had to charm my way of being arrested. Uh, in Spain, I ended up going to the Ayuntamiento, the city hall, and obtaining a literal poetic license. <laughs> and had to show to the police as identification. This must be because poetry is dangerous. I wrote this while the Obama administration was bombing the Middle East. It's for a family on vacation who complained they hadn't seen a single ghost. If you want a ghost story, just Turn on the news. There's no need to choreograph a pageantry of fear. Why fetishize the gore of a city's history when it's already on our hands? You want to be haunted? Okay, your taxes pay for the fleets of robots to rain death onto the children of the faraway villages you cannot pronounce right now. And now, and now, and now. This work also occasionally involves eternal boredom while I wait for passers-by to approach. I type these avant-garde images I call text clouds, a palimpsest accumulated through hundreds of hours of waiting, watching, of failure and prayer when I'm left with truly nothing but memory to sustain me. My long-lost fiance from Washington Square Park, she sent me a message later that night saying the poem had changed her DNA. Whenever I am alone or in darkness, I think of her words and remember poetry is not just a game for the upper middle class to play in universities, but a way of saving one another. And it's also a pair of wings. Woo!